voice matters, voice matters. Welcome, voice friends, to another episode of Interviews on Voice Matters. Today, I have with us uh, Dave Isaacs, and he is a guitar teacher. My name is Liz Johnson, by the way. And today's conversation is a little outside the lines, but also inside the lines, because I really admire how Dave thinks about teaching and music and all these things. Dave and I have known each other for years. We've taught a couple of workshops together, which we called Sing and Play, which were a chance for people to take a deeper dive into singing and playing the guitar at the same time. So I did the voice stuff and he did the guitar stuff and we kind of all worked those things together. And the biggest reason that I wanted to talk to Dave today is because of this book. So he's written a book called The Perpetual Beginner and the subtitle is A Musician's Path to Lifelong Learning, which if you, um, have run in any spiritual circles or you've talked to anybody maybe in a, a Buddhist context or whatever, there is this concept that we are constantly learning and we're constant. If you can bring yourself back to like a, a childlike wonder and curiosity about learning, um, it's a really beautiful place to be. Um, and we're all kind of beginning again every single day, which is a, a a viewpoint that really makes me feel a lot of relief in life instead of trying to make everything great. And I don't know if that's where you got the title, Dave, but welcome. Thank you. Um, it kind of is, though. I mean, it's certainly a related idea. As you were describing this about the childlike wonder, I think about uh, something I referenced in the book, which is a pair of workshops that I went to in college with the jazz cellist David Darling. Uh, started an organization back in the 80s called Music for People. And these were very open improvisation work up, workshops. So it wasn't like this is a jazz workshop or this is um, oriented in a specific way musically, but just for everyone. And so there were people who are skilled classical musicians and people with very little musical experience at all. And by the end of the day, he had everybody playing together. It was amazing. Wow. But he started off by talking about how in playing music, you have to be like the fool. Yeah. And the fool is not foolish. The fool is just innocent and everything is new. And I still have this mental picture of him going, the fool is like, <gasps> <laughs> everything is exciting. Oh my God, what's that? And just like you said, that childlike wonder it's the same thing that I saw when my granddaughter, who is now six, uh, saw a piano for the first time. And she went over to it and she went, bink, and looked up at me. And I went, bink, bink, bink. I looked up with a smile, bink, 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 bink. And then five minutes later, this is going on. And it was absolutely that same process. It was, process. It was what was that? Oh, that's neat. Yeah. Well, what happens if I do this? Hmm. If I do this, that happens. That is what we're aiming for. The perpetual beginner title came partly from an observation that in my private teaching, I was working mostly with people with more experience and enthusiasm than skill. Ah. So I would say my average student might be over 40 and well, maybe not over 40, but an adult yep. who played an instrument when they were younger. And many of them had played the guitar as kids or high school or college, a lot of college, and then dropped it after that and then come back to it at some point. Or living in Nashville, we work with a lot of songwriters and writers are picking up the guitar for utilitarian purposes. It's, this is something I'm going to use to write songs. And so many people get the basics that they need to do that and pretty much stay there. So someone might have played for 20 or 30 years, but still have essentially beginner level skills. Oh, okay. So there's the two sides to it because the thing that that person really needs is to embrace the beginner mindset and it's funny what you were what you said a moment ago about what a relief it is yeah to take this because i go through i suppose maybe it's the fall that always seems to do this to me but you get into this backward looking mindset and you start sort of taking stock of things 
I'm approaching my 55th birthday. So of course this kind of thing starts to happen <laughs> and you start thinking about your trajectory and where are you in your trajectory? <laughs> Right. And at 55, for God's sake, what have you accomplished? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Overwhelming. Where it's, hey, it's a new day. What happens now? Yeah. Much better. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, um, one of the things that you're talking about that brings to mind what we do in the studio, the voice studio all the time, is like, let's just make sound. Mm. Let's just make a sound and try it out. And and after a while, you, you're a professional, you're working you know, it's like almost taboo to try sounds because you're, it, everything is like everything you do in work is like on the line. It's all deliverables. Right, exactly. But where's the, the fun in just making sound? And the other concept that I try to introduce regularly now is like, you know what? It's all just data. This sound mm -hmm. is going to tell you something just like your granddaughter, like, oh, oh, interesting. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I tell people it's like just private. Like your your granddaughter wasn't trying to get a gig at the at um, you know Carnegie <laughs> Hall. She was just like, oh, that's cool, right? And even though we can't always go there necessarily because we have a job to do or whatever, I get it. That mentality, just having a conversation about it, I think is invaluable because we all need that reminder as adults, right? Like that, you know, just because we're a certain age, like you're talking about doesn't mean that there's not more to learn or something else to explore or more data to collect. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the fundamental, this is the flip side of the perpetual beginner concept is that with experience, you have familiarity with more and more situations. So that means that you can assess and react to something faster. But it also means that if you have seen these indicators 17 times the 18th time you're going to just say okay i can go here whereas maybe there's another factor that you hadn't seen and because you're not trying to take in everything yeah you are missing really the key and I, it's the funny thing is i've been you know released this book in 2019 so i have been over the past three years, trying to distill the ideas down as much as I can. Like, where's the TED talk with this book? Right. <laughs> Which was challenging because it took several years to write it and there's a lot in there. It's almost a, one of my friends called it a manifesto. And I said, well, yeah, I, th I think that's guilty as charged, at least as far as a statement of philosophy. But really that idea that there's always something else that you can do yeah. another perspective that maybe your initial instinct as a professional or as an experienced person is just to take this path maybe that path is automatic yeah. it's just so well worn water flows downhill this is where we go every time and i was talking with a friend of mine who is a has been a successful recording engineer all his life and also is one of these people that's good with his hands knows how to build things um I have a number of friends like this that can look at a pile of wood and see a house. Mm. Whereas I don't have the skills for that. My spatial sense seems to be oriented more towards music and the way notes relate to each other that I have to be shown. Like for years, I thought I wasn't mechanically inclined hmm. until I realized that there is just a spatial sense in the brain that I don't have very strongly. And so I need to be pointed in that direction. So in the same way, you can say to somebody, hey, listen to the difference between this and this. And they say, there's a difference. And you say, yes, listen for. And then you have to, of course, find the right word that makes that person's brain click into the place you're trying to lead them. But and you tell me what you think about this. But in my experience, when you're trying to get somebody to perceive an aspect of music they haven't heard before, point it out to them and they generally will notice it. Yep. Yeah, but the, that's the that's the learning curve is where we're pointing the attention. Right. So getting back to what my my friend said about um, my engineer friend said, he read the chapter about practicing and problem solving. And he said, you know, what you're describing is how you would solve any engineering problem, ah. which is just evaluate the problem, 
pinpoint the actual source, what should be happening that isn't, or what is happening that shouldn't be, and then you brainstorm the solutions. I mean, I remember learning this in fourth grade or whatever it was, you know, in science class, and everyone raise their hand, come up with every ridiculous idea they can come up with, and then you, okay, no, we won't do that, we won't do that, let's try this. And this is how problems are solved in anything. Yeah. So here we are in music, or here's me going, I'm not mechanically inclined. Yeah. You can teach me how to build a house. Yeah. You just need to point my attention in the right place because my perspective wasn't allowing me to see really the thing that I needed. Yeah. So in music, we say, well, I'm not talented or I'm not musical or I don't have rhythm or whatever it is that people say, because culturally we don't share music anymore, except perhaps in church or any, some kind of spiritual practice where people might actually sing together. But it used to be something people did. Yeah. You know, like I, I have this theory that um, British pop music was so good for so many years with so much was so melodic and so melodically inventive because the English sing. Wow. You know what I mean? They sing pub songs. They sing football songs. They, oh. uh, and maybe this hit me, maybe they don't. And maybe you're going to get all these messages from people in the British Isles saying, what are you talking about? You Americans don't know anything, <laughs> but <clears throat> seems to me you grew up with songs or at least don't. Yeah, and or maybe singing. at least the generation that was making the music you and I grew up on, perhaps. Yeah. I don't know about now. Um, but just culturally speaking, if music is not something that's collectively in your universe, you're going to think that either you're special or you're not. Yeah. You have it or you don't. And if you yeah. don't have it and you still love it, you're going into it with the immediate, I, I don't know, you must not get this as a, I, I can't imagine people think this way about singing, but guitar, I get people come in and say, well, I don't have to be good. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a minute. So what does that mean? Well, I don't need to go, you know, weedly, weedly, weedly and all of that and say, well, no, you don't. You shouldn't even be thinking about that in the first place, you know, unless that's what's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if shredding is exciting, then great. Learn how to shred. But so where do you, where's that coming from then? Do you think that people say, well, I don't need to be good? It's an athletic mindset. It's saying, I don't have to do anything fancy. My, I have humble goal. I have simple goals. Yeah. But it, I don't see any reason to kneecap yourself like that when, mm. um, you know, one, another lesson that I talk about in the book is going from a intensive jazz workshop to a folk music retreat one straight to the other whoa and going from situations where you couldn't put two people together without them stepping all over each other these were guitar players all with identical jazz box guitars you know semi hollow bodies and real books and you know <laughs> students everybody's still learning but it's very this arpeggio this chord this you know, very clinical and very difficult for people to actually make much music together because they're so deep in the, you know, in the minutia of that. I go to folky camp and I'm playing three chord songs with people, except that they're playing with a lot more authority and confidence than I can manage. I was in between undergrad and grad school, about to start my master's program in classical guitar. And I'm, you know, I'm a sophisticated musician and they're playing folk songs. And I'm trying to play a boom chick as confidently as they are. And I'm struggling to keep up. And here's 17 people sitting in a circle playing six instruments and singing five part harmony. And I'm going, who's the better musicians here? Whoa, whoa. <laughs> so that was eye opening. You know, yeah. it was how well can you do this little thing? So when someone says, I don't need to be good, but I mean, if I sit up, if I get up on stage at a songwriter's night where let's say odds are most people are not gonna be real skilled and I can play something really simple, you still can tell I can play. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. You, by the way that simple thing comes across, that I'm going to use that word authoritative because yeah. I think that's really what we're going for. And that's the thing that struck me about some of these folk musicians is it was so authoritative. Yeah. And so to go back to what you, oh, maybe you said this before we actually started the formal interview, but um, you said, why would a singer read a book by a guitar player? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, right? <laughs> and I will say that the book is a memoir in the sense that I am telling stories, but it's a memoir format because I was thinking about when I was a student, young musician where I didn't know anything, and I'm taking in all this data, all this information. I don't know if that's coming through. I'm sure it is. We'll say hello <laughs> to my friend in the other room there. I might leave um, that in. It's cute. Yeah, right. Well, it'll be it'll be cute until it's not. But <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking back and saying, out of all that information, obviously there are skills, there is fundamentals of music that you know all these things that you learn early on that you lean on your key signatures your circle of fifths you're this you're that right that's yeah. all your fundamental training but what are the things that really impact in a way that 30 years later i'm using these skills every day mm. or i'm using these perspectives every day i might have learned you know or somebody like we've been talking about someone brings your attention to the right thing yeah so i might have had an interaction with somebody Maybe I heard them speak, maybe I saw them perform, maybe I studied with them for five years, but something stayed with me. And so the best way to explore that was to tell the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's where I was, here's who I was with, and here's what happened. Here's why it matters to me, Yeah. and here's why it matters to you. Yeah. And so there's a lot of philosophical, conceptual stuff, and um, I start off, talking about when I first started playing, what was motivating to me. Yeah. Which for, you know, lots of teenagers, it was, I'm a whole lot cooler when I start doing this. Plus it feels really good Yeah. and it's fun. Yeah. So I'm going to do this. And we start looking at, well, what is it actually that's feeding this? And so if 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line, you still like it but it's not exciting, it's not feeling good, you feel kind of stuck, you're not. So what did light you up in the first place? Yeah. And I find it, it's, um, obviously lots of people had things reset, reshuffled, changed in some way over the course of the pandemic, the last couple of years. Yeah. And one thing that happened to me was you're talking about as a performing musician and being out there doing your gigs and it's always hit the target, hit the target, hit the target because you're being paid to be a professional. Yeah. So everything shuts down. I'm home. And for the first time in 25 years, I can pick up a guitar and just make a sound. Wow. And I just wrote a book about going back to the things that inspired you and connecting. And so I spent a good year and a half playing my freshman year classical repertoire that I hadn't touched in years and years and years. Wow. And it was so much fun and I enjoyed it so much more than I had as a student because there was nothing riding on it. Yeah. And it was freshman, I mean, it was by a classical guitarist standards, it's baby steps repertoire. Yeah. And I gave myself permission to suck. I'm gonna forget about my master's degree yeah. I'm going to forget about all of the stuff I know about this. I am playing this humble little study and I'm just trying to play it well. Yeah. And when I started, it was like five minutes of think, think before this hand started complaining. Mm. And over a period of time, that began to open up. And I've since um, written and released two collections of solo guitar music. That's fantastic. Which is something I've wanted to do since I was in college. And maybe it was a grandiose uh, sense of wanting to be a composer with my name on a piece of sheet music, but well, I did it. That's great. And that has no bearing on anything else I do professionally, except for the fact that as a teacher, I want to embody the things I'm trying to teach. I want to do it myself. 
Yeah. And so I started putting these videos on YouTube of me practicing and showing my mistakes, you know, like, and playing absurdly slowly and just tuning in, making sounds. And that makes me think of what you said about as a singer, just making a sound. Mm -hmm. One of the most impactful voice coaches I ever had uh, when I worked with Jonathan Hart in New York City back in the 80s, 90s, um, he taught me to explore what my voice does as opposed to trying to get it to do anything. Ah, and he would totally encourage good. me to make ugly sounds. Yeah. So he would sit at the piano and play chords and I would be just moving around the studio and vocalizing. And it was really amazing because instead of thinking about um, the mechanics of breathing and tone production and all the things that one can get into, and that's not what I needed at that point. What I needed at that point was just sensation and feeling. Mm -hmm. And so when all of a sudden now your voice comes in here and this thing starts to happen and you realize, wow, I have so much more expressive potential here, even as I'm speaking to you. And now I'm playing with it because I'm having fun with my cartoon voices. And now you go, oh, wow, this is this whole other world. Yeah. And then you realize, hey, wow, you should practice singing really softly because this is a different feeling than when I'm trying to sing. It's all the same thing. So, you know, my sitting with the classical guitar and trying to tune into this hand over here that I hadn't really spent much time training in 25 years in that way. Wow. And fighting against my own, you know, years of you're supposed to know this, you're a professional guitar guru, you know? <laughs> exactly. You know, you just have to block all that out. So I, in some ways, it was the pandemic that allowed me to do that because there wasn't that much going on anyway. Nobody was listening anyhow. Yep. You know, and then realizing like, hey, people are responding to the message of this book. Well, let me keep illustrating this. So I'm actually about to put an album out. I'm uh, I just uploaded the files to the distributor day before yesterday and dropped off a master disc for CD duplication because, hey, why not? I still want something physical. Yeah. And it's you. those yeah. the, the last set of guitar solos that I wrote, but expanded into ensembles. So. I wrote them as solo pieces and published them that way as exercises and then brought in other musicians and used those as foundations for larger settings. So there's some with rhythm section, there's some where I just overlay keyboard parts, there's some with percussion. It's such a cool project. And it just started with my sort of chasing this enthusiasm. You know, like yeah. this has no bearing to what I, other things I might be doing professionally, but it's lighting me up. Yeah. You know, and now putting this album out, it's like full circle. Yeah. Now what's next? Now I want to play country music. Go figure. Exactly. <laughs> it's kind of where the muse is taking you, right? Yes. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's it. It's like a, a combination of perpetual beginner and always bringing yourself back to what's lighting you up in the moment. Not yesterday, yes. not tomorrow. Mm -hmm. right here right now minus all of the chatter which is just your brain telling you stories versus mm -hmm. like but i want to play country music right and there's no story around it it's just what you want to do like right yeah right yeah. it's just wow this is fun so all of a sudden i'm listening yeah. to buck owens going yeah 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 i'm just i'm i'm feeling this and you know to be fair there's also a degree of professionally i've certainly drifted off into my own little universe and I do live in Nashville and I do like this music, so let's reel it back in a little bit. But at the same time, it really is just chasing the enthusiasms. For a while in the middle of the pandemic, I went down a hard rock rabbit hole and that was just fun. Yeah. You know, and I, I tell my students all the time that if you're not being inspired by what you're doing, then just think of the last thing that inspired you. You know, like, what's the last song you heard that made you go, oh, yeah, that's cool. And wouldn't it be fun to say, you know what? I've never really tried to play that. Let me try to play that. 
Yeah. I did a lot of that. Like, you know, you can probably, you can relate to this as a gigger as well. Songs that you might've performed a couple of hundred times. And then you hear the original version and you think, oh, wow. Yeah. There's so much in there that I never picked up on. And as a, you know, gigging barroom musician, you're constantly getting people make requests where you go, oh, yeah, I, I could do that. And next thing you know, your fake your way through it version is the way you've done it for 20 years. Yeah. yeah. So you listen to that recording and you go, oh, wow, this is fun. Yeah. And you start digging into what was actually there. And, you know, I'm a geek for this stuff, so it gets me excited. Yeah. See, this is precisely um, why I wanted to talk to you, Dave, is because you're a science person. You've got a science brain. Like you're interested in all these like nerdy facets of things, which I think just makes everything very rich and interesting and also blends itself to teaching, right? Because then you're excited to share this with somebody else, which to me is the intersection of that's the part I love. It's just like yeah. being in that point of like, oh, wow. Cause then when they get it, you get right. it on a different level. And it's just, it's like, it's so delicious. Okay. So I'm, I'm just riffing here, obviously. But I do want to ask you one pointer in the book, right? So just for everyone out there, when you read this book, you've read it, right? You've gone through it. One fun way to, to do this book, and some books this works better than others, is roulette. So what I love to do sometimes is just flip it open to a page, read a, a couple concepts, and then just sit with it. And, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, I've been thinking about that. In this context, so anyway, it's just one of these magical ways to read a book. So I did that today, and the concept that I landed on was something else, doing something else, okay? I kind of want to just take a couple minutes to unpack that a little bit. When you say just do something else, right, I can see that being a very frustrating instruction, and I can also see that being a very <laughs> wonderful instruction. So can we, can we talk about just do something else for a second? Yes. Well, so I'll give a little background on where that came from, which I, is I was on a gig and this was definitely one of these sort of free form. Um, we generally wouldn't plan anything. I didn't always even know who was going to be there with me. Sometimes they didn't know the songs. And this was the kind of room where I could get away with this. So I'll just I'm going to teach the band a song right now and just play it. So there's lots of faking our way through. And of course, it's it's fun. I like that free form kind of thing. But you still end up falling into songs you might have played 500 times. And so we're playing a blues tune or something, which I still enjoy playing. But as I'm playing, I'm realizing I'm just stale. This Everything I'm doing is entirely predictable. I could have told you what I was going to do. I could have sat at the bar and gone, I know what that guy's going to do. And as I'm playing, I thought, well, wait a minute. Okay, don't do that, do this. And it started off something as simple as don't keep going, stop there. Or don't stop there, keep going. Ah. Sometimes that's all it was that as an improviser, I mean, just in the way that we were talking earlier before we started recording about the frustrations of making videos and being a content creator and that aspect of what we do. And I don't know about you, but over the years of doing this, I have learned how many verbal tics I have because I'd watch a video and catch myself repeating phrases that were not really adding anything, but it was just a thing that came out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? That kind of thing. Um, you know, that's my New Yorker comes out with my hands too, but all these little interjections. And I think we do that when we play. That there are licks I can play that are basically a twitch. Mm. It has about as much significance as a twitch. It was just weedly wee. And I've done that so many times that in the right context, sure, it's still a musical statement, but I didn't make a statement just now. I twitched and that's what came out. Yeah. So just connecting to i'm not letting muscle memory drive the bus here i am going to sing this line when i play it maybe for a singer it's i'm going to play this line when i sing it i don't know there's uh, i find and we've talked about this before that a fundamental difference to me as someone who does play and sing and has worked on both of those things is that I have tried to learn to 
control my voice the way I can control my hands in the sense that I can be intentional about choosing my notes and the tone that I'm going for and the attack that I'm using. And that's something that's been learned over time. But the, the physical experience of that is very different because the voice is something that, broadly speaking, we use intuitively, mm-hmm. at least when we're talking. And it's very easy for, you know, lots of people will sing to themselves and not know they're singing. Yeah. Or not admit that they're singing, but they will still do it. So it's inherently more natural than playing a guitar, at least. Yeah. But that in the sense of I'm making choices in the moment and directing the mechanism to do X, it is the same. Yeah. But experientially, a guitar is a foreign object. And so one Uh, of the things I find the singers that I work like a, a comfortable confident singer picks up a guitar for the first time and here is this box that you've got to negotiate and your whole mental picture of where you are where your sound is coming from how you're carrying your body the entire ecosystem has just been upset because we've introduced this object that now you have to negotiate and so this tactile thing kicks in that's completely distracting from what was going on up here Hmm. and how does this relate to do something different well it doesn't yet because obviously we're outside of automatic now but in our sing and play workshops we made a discovery that i think we both knew but maybe hadn't been articulated in quite this way, which is that the bridge between the playing and the singing is the breath. Yeah. Because the breath carries the voice and also allows the body to feel the move, the rhythm in the movement. When you're not breathing, you're just moving. You're not going to feel any rhythm out of it. Yeah. And maybe that's the something different is just let me try to connect these things. It doesn't have to be as specific as I'm going to play a longer phrase or sing a longer phrase. It can just be, well, wait a minute. Let me pay attention to how X and Y actually connect to each other here. Yeah. Yeah. Like I love, um, and I think I'm pretty sure that this is what this is. Um, One of the workshops you had everybody doing this, hand move of just directing and that's something i've stolen i've been using this a lot i'm pretty sure you still have it up on the whiteboard because i look over there and right and so there's a little drawing that i'm pretty sure is somebody's feet so that's why (laughs) it's like exactly right this right yeah but those kinds of things like people don't think it's back to perpetual beginner if you were in first grade and you were doing little rhythm games you wouldn't think anything of it You know, as an adult, you're like, I feel ridiculous. What am I doing here? And then you realize, well, wait a minute. This is just moving in space. Yep. And did you in school, did you use the Hindemith uh, elementary training textbook? Have you come across that one? Okay. Um, Elementary training for musicians by Paul Hindemith, who was a very uh, intimidating and thorny uh, 20th century uh, German composer came over to the U.S. before the Second World War or during the Second World War. I don't remember exactly, but the book is fantastic, but I hated it as a student because I read the foreword and it said, well, anyone starting a uh, conservatory program should be OK with about two thirds of this book. And page two was scary. And oh, it was like, yeah, yeah, but he had everything divided up into action in time which is rhythm yeah action in space which is pitch coordinated action Mm. and i thought looking at it as an adult that's brilliant it's perfect because talking about spatial sense you know i'm going to refer back to the pile of wood and seeing a house and how the the spatial sense to visualize how those pieces fit is not something that comes easily to me. I needed to be shown that, right? So my mind likes the musical abstraction, but it's not abstract in the way I think of it, or at least in the way I've been taught to think of it, 
in visualizing, imagining a scale as a ladder or a series of physical steps that you climb, mm -hmm. right? That that abstraction is very concrete in the way that we've been taught to think about it. And so you can picture one of these visualizations of a Bach fugue and you can follow the voices and this purple line is the top melody and then it's gonna drop down here and this blue line is the bass and you've all seen all these things. That's very concrete to me. And I'm learning as over the years in teaching that it's not concrete at all to everybody. Yeah. And sometimes that do something else is, well, look at it this way. Yeah. Yeah. And our job is to find where somebody isn't seeing that. Yeah. And that's, that's maybe what a lesson is, is like, well, let's do this. Let's do that. Let's just do something else. Yeah. than what you're used to. And, um, mm -hmm. and bringing that back to the lap pattern stuff that you're demonstrating for the uh, super nerds in the house. Um, I learned that from Marianne Ploger, and uh, she has an entire method for learning, conceptualizing and embodying music that I think is radi radical. Mm -hmm. She um, studied with Boulanger in, mm -hmm. in Paris, I believe, right? Am I right about yeah, that? That would be, yeah. Anyway, so she she's just, she's on like a different planet and way of, just incredible in how she thinks about things and, and that the embodiment of the the um the beats is oh, look designed at that. she's to, at vanderbilt yeah she's at vanderbilt they hired wow. her several wow. years ago and i got to take one of her trainings but anyway just some of the most radical stuff but the the counting on the body her part of the point of that from her perspective is that you're placing each beat on an individual body part and helping the body, the yes. brain differentiate. So instead of one, 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 you have one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Four. I like that. Yeah. Right. And to mm -hmm. me, I'm, I'm always coming back to like your brain, like if we can just program your brain in a different way. Right. So it's just kind of getting people in touch with that. And I, I use that all the time. So if anybody wants to know more about that, either visit Mary Ann's work or ask some questions. So, um, but yeah, you know, and my, uh, Hey, 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 enthusiasm started to kick up as you were talking about that, because another one of my pet points here is guitar is a tactile instrument. And in the sense that you touch it or hit it. And so there is a point of arrival of impact even that you might call, you know, hitting the strings. There's a percussive aspect to it. And I think when I look back to what made me take to the guitar is that I think my body liked that, that, and yeah. even like, I love to hike and I swear that just the rhythm of that with my feet is connected somehow to that and getting back to singers and the perception of music, bringing something like those lap patterns in where you connect another aspect of physicality to what is otherwise an abstract yes. idea. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really that's a really nice way of buttoning that up and thinking about and, it. And you know, it leads yeah. to a thought even so for the singers out there that are struggling with learning to accompany themselves, especially if the challenge is keeping time and then being able to sing to that at the same time that the guitar equivalent of a lap pattern would be just to say mute your strings or hold one chord and just ding, and just think of it as a drum yeah and just getting that sensation you know like if i pick up a drumstick and do this and i hand this to almost anybody and say can you do that they would say yes but then take the exact same orientation and replace the drumstick with the guitar pick and do this. And the brain goes, <laughs> yeah. So just, and it's related to that spatial thing again, yeah. right? Like yeah. You move this and all of a sudden you don't know where anything is. So now you have to find well, where am I here? Well, okay. Now, Ooh, I stood up. Now I'm somewhere else. <laughs> it's amazing how much there is to that and maybe that's another something else yeah yeah how about sit in another chair how about don't sit yeah exactly how about sit down <laughs> yeah yeah exactly all, all the things and i'm going to add one thing and then kind of wrap it up because 
um, I would like to continue talking with you. So just for future reference, is it okay if we, you know, do a couple more of these and just sure, sure, about? no, this is great. Okay, cool. Um, uh, at the Nashville Jazz Workshop where I teach, um, Lori Meacham teaches a class called Get in the Pocket, and she has singers sit behind the drum kit and just learn some real basic hi hat, you know, just some mm, nice. not, nothing complicated, you know, get right. the two in the four and all stuff. And it's funny how people react to that class. They love it. Mm, yeah, yeah. Even though all, in, self included, like me behind with drumsticks, like forget about it. But it, there's still something about that that's just so challenging. And when you do it in a very open, accepting, like loving environment, then you can just sit there and all of a sudden people are playing drums. Right. And someone else is singing and then they switch. You know what I mean? And it's just such a, a cool experience. So, um, I, can't, I think maybe part of my takeaway today is like, just do anything different, anything, yeah. you know, and try something. So, you know, if you're a singer and you've never touched a guitar, pick up a guitar. You don't have to be, you don't have to be great at it. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, thank you. Uh, Instagram and the whole internet. Um, right. Right. Athleticism. Well, the entire athleticism of music and American Idol and vocal licks and yada, yada, yada. It's, it's but, the guitar but, equivalent is, it, th there is a phrase I see people using, Instagram guitarist, which means somebody who plays lots and lots of notes in their stories every day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is great too, carry on. Yes, and, it is. And, you know, to bring it back to what you are saying earlier, how are you following your enthusiasm? what is your genuine enthusiasm and if you don't know what that is then go back to something that you felt enthusiastic about and kind of tune into that feeling and then see what the what the enthusiasm for you is today not instagram right. not any anyone else right but um but yeah this is mm -hmm. this is really good well dave i have to say thank you so much for taking the time to do this on camera i love our talks always and to have one captured um which is a weird word, um, but to have one on recording and to documented, do documented for ever <laughs> and ever and ever until right. the internet fails, um, right? You know, but you know, this a book, hard copy book is never going to fail you. So anyway, I I can't say enough about this. I've really enjoyed it, and um, I keep playing roulette with it, and uh, and keep learning more and more about myself and how to teach better and to be a better human, let alone a uh, musician. So thank you for taking the time and going through all of the struggles that it, that it takes to get something creative actually manifested in the world. We appreciate you. And um, hopefully we will get to do one of these again very soon. Well, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Voice matters, voice matters.